So today I wanted to tell you my story and how I got into quantum computing. This channel is mostly quantum computing and coding and you may be wondering how did I find quantum computing and what's been my journey? And maybe my story will be a little disappointing to some of you because I did not intentionally get into quantum computing. And my journey to physics and quantum computing actually starts really long ago. So just a few stats about me. I was born in Moscow and I'm 29 years old. When I was a year and a half old we moved to Amsterdam. My dad was doing his PhD in physics there. When I was seven years old, I moved to the US, so my education has mostly been in the United States. And I've been in quantum computing for over 12 years, so I've really seen the field evolve over that time. My dad's a physicist, so I was always around science and technology. I just always really loved reading and learning, and my parents really encouraged that with science museums and Legos, and my dad would even take me to work in the physics lab. I actually didn't realize for a long, long time, I mean, I think I was 13 when I realized that people don't actually always get PhDs. I thought that was required. In high school, I decided to go to a math and science magnet school because of the robotics team. I participated in first robotics and best robotics, and honestly, it was the first time where I really didn't feel like I was the totally weird kid at school. I was definitely around my people. I spent the summer after 10th grade at a program called Governor's Honors Program in Valdosta, Georgia. There, I majored in technology and minored in math, so I spent the whole summer building CAD models and robots and programming Tetra solvers with AI. And after that program, I just knew I didn't want to spend another two years in high school. I mean, I already had so many credits and I was so far ahead because I was in a math and science school. And as it turns out, you can just graduate high school if you have all your credits. I figured if I applied for college this year and didn't get in, I could just reapply next year. But I actually ended up getting accepted to Georgia Tech, so after three years of high school, I went to college at age 16. Since I loved programming on my robotics team so much, I actually declared myself as a computer science major at first. But after about a semester of those classes, I realized I didn't want to just study programming. I wanted to use computer science as a tool for something else and not study it just because. So I ended up transferring to biology and after about a semester of that, I got bored there as well because the textbooks were so thick and it was a lot about memorization. Eventually, that second semester in college, I took physics one and I really loved it and I was good at it. But what I really liked about it was number one, the textbooks were tiny. Sometimes you spend the entire semester on just one equation. My favorite example of this was thermodynamics. My aerospace engineering friends were so mad because I had like a 120 page textbook that was pretty simple and they had this 1200 page manual tome book that they had to study. And number two why I liked physics is that it was actually really hard. Maybe some people just enjoy crying over textbooks. And if that's how you feel, physics is definitely for you. I'm totally mostly kidding, but I did spend one night in the library. I remember it was my second year and I was crying over this Hamiltonian and classical mechanics. Turns out I had done 6 minus 5 equals 2 or something, and that's why the math didn't work out. And of course, that error was on like page 2 of a 10 page derivation. But honestly, I embraced that challenge because I was interested in learning more and seeing the world differently. My first year at Georgia Tech when I was exploring majors and figuring out what I wanted to do, I of course was part of the robotics team, but I also did research in chemical engineering. I worked in a lab doing transdermal drug delivery with microneedles. The idea was that we can make shots less painful by using microneedles on patches that would go into your skin. However, the summer before my second year in college, when I knew I wanted to be in physics, I started emailing professors in the department asking if they had research positions open. While some universities have job boards and see what positions are open, we didn't have that. So I just emailed and asked. The first lab that I actually emailed was a biophysics lab. They did stuff on the physics of animal motion, so it was a very popular lab to be in. However, later on, we actually discovered they weren't really good at keeping the animals locked up tight because my new lab was actually next door to their lab. Once they actually accidentally let a snake loose and the snake found its way to our lab and actually curled up on the little lasers to keep warm. And they didn't lock up the cockroach eggs too well either. So that was fun. But that lab told me they'd only hire third level and up students because they wanted you to have taken some courses before participating in the lab. The second lab I emailed actually said yes. This lab was a quantum optics and quantum information lab. What they were doing was long distance quantum communication. So I basically came to that lab with no experience, barely any coursework, but what I could do after robotics was solder. So I got very lucky to get in so early in my college career. So they sat me down and they said, great, you can solder, build some laser locking boxes. And I did and I stayed in that lab for three years. And in those three years, I did a lot. So first, I worked on neutral atom quantum memories. What we worked on was trying to increase the coherence time or the length of quantum information being stored in these neutral atoms. From the time I've started to the time I've left, we went from 10 microseconds coherence time to over one second. And this is a huge amount of time in the quantum information space, especially compared to superconducting qubits. 
We also did some super cool research on whether we could preserve quantum information while transitioning photons in different wavelengths. Now, why would we even want to do this? Well, these photons that stored the quantum information would be sent over fiber optics. Fiber optics are optimized for certain wavelengths, about 1200 nanometers. Unfortunately, the photon that we created by exciting the valence electron in rubidium up to the first excited state and that decaying to the ground state was about 800 nanometers. We did a technique called four-wave mixing, and as it turns out, we could preserve the quantum information through that transition. And through this all, I set up an entire lab from scratch. I designed this ultra-cool high vacuum system. You get it? Ultra-cool? In contrast to superconducting qubits, which are cooled inside these super-cool gold chandeliers to temperatures like 10 millikelvin, neutral atoms are put into ultra-high vacuum systems that suck all the other particles out of the system, and then we shoot lasers at the atoms and trap them and slow them down. The atoms are in the super-cool glass case here. Now, lasers to cool atoms? How does that work? Well, photons do have a momentum. It's kind of like trying to stop an elephant with ping pong balls, but it does work. Then I took a little bit of a detour and accidentally started a company. Now, let me know if anyone's interested in this longer story and the experience, but basically my friend and I crashed the Georgia Tech servers one night. We were scraping a lot of data off a website at our school and we didn't really know how to do caching yet. And a lot of people started using our tool and so the more people used it, the more aggressively it hit that website and we basically DDoS the school. It was all very Mark Zuckerberg slash the social network where we had to go in front of the honor board and everything. Except we were like, oh sorry, we didn't know how to do caching and they just let us off. Anyway, there was a professor in the computer science department who had also started a company and he thought it was hilarious. So he called us up and said, hey, I have a startup incubator. Here's a check for seed funding. See you later. So instead of going to graduate school, which was my plan, I decided to try and make this a company. I'd already applied for grad school and taken the physics jury, kind of bombed it, but I'd actually gotten into a few good schools and deferred my admission for a year. If you haven't heard of the GRE, it's kind of like the SAT, so it covers math and English in the main sections. The math portion is a little bit harder than the SAT, but definitely reasonable. The English part, however, is absolutely awful. Back in my day, part of the test would be like, here's a word, what's the antonym? And that was it, no context clues or anything. Then there's also the physics GRE, which covers basically all physics ever. But the GRE rant is a video for another time. I spent about a year and a half working on this company. It was a way for students to get jobs out of university and help them build their skills. Coursera and Udacity had just about launched at this time. So the idea was if you wanted, for example, to be an engineer at Google, but you didn't know Java, we could tell you about courses that you could take to boost your skills and connect you with the recruiters. So we did the whole startup incubator thing, and we learned a lot about building products, the lean startup, and product market fit. And this is where I started to code a lot more, getting into Node, Django, front end, back end. I kind of touched everything. And I also had to learn how to talk to people and convince them to buy our product. And at this time, I was 20 years old and I had no idea what I was doing, but I loved every second of this super terrifying experience. After we were kind of acquired by another company, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with myself. So since I had deferred my graduate school admission, I went back for my PhD at the University of Maryland College Park at the Joint Quantum Institute. After startup life though, graduate school felt really slow. I had a full fellowship, which meant I didn't have to do any teaching or research to get paid. In science PhD programs, your tuition is fully covered and you get paid. It's low though, about $32,000 a year. I looked into working in some labs, but I already had a bunch of research experience coming into graduate school. So the idea of doing this for another five years kind of felt depressing to me. It wasn't that the research was unexciting, but in some labs, the professors were never there. Also at that time, I didn't have US citizenship, so some of the labs I couldn't even work in due to the different funding they received from government agencies. Now, this is nothing against University of Maryland. It's actually an amazing school and has a great quantum program. I actually really recommend applying there if you want to go into quantum technologies, but at that time, that didn't seem like the right fit for me. And at some point, I decided I didn't want to be a professor anymore. And I saw how depressed some of the graduate students were. Some came there because they didn't know what else to do. And that, I think, is the biggest mistake you can make with graduate school. Don't go there just because you don't know what else to do. So after a year and a half, I ended up leaving graduate school. I ended up being hired by a quantum computing company called Rigetti Quantum Computing in California, and they moved me out from Maryland. They had just graduated from Y Combinator, which was a startup incubator in Palo Alto, when I was interviewing, and there were only about three people at the company. This was actually kind of a shift for me, because I'd been doing neutral atoms in undergrad. So in graduate school, I was thinking about going into trapped ions. One of the professors at Maryland was Chris Monroe, who then started Ion Q. So the superconducting qubits at Rigetti were totally new to me. However, I was able to do business and science and engineering all at once, and it seemed perfect. And that's when I started writing on my blog more. 
So back in graduate school, I'd already written a few articles on quantum security because, hey, I was in DC, security is a big thing there. My first two posts went kind of viral and I was being seen as a part of the quantum research community even though I'd never gotten my PhD. Honestly, I think a lot of people now assume that I actually got my PhD, but nope, I didn't, I dropped out. Of course, that's not really the path I'd recommend to everyone. I got lucky. Research is fantastic and big name labs are fantastic, but what I really recommend for people going to graduate school is to be very careful in picking your advisor. Eventually, I left that company as well and actually went to work for a few traditional software companies and learned a lot of new skills. And I had that sweet, sweet software tech salary. And now I had a lot of super marketable business and tech skills. I actually did consider going back to graduate school for a while, but I feel like right now there's so many opportunities to get involved in quantum computing outside of academia. So right now, I don't feel like I really need the degree. I'm working in software engineering and doing deep technical work and working on this YouTube channel on my blog. So now I'm doing a lot of coding still, mostly in Golang and Python, but working on superconducting qubits still. Bleximo, which means entanglement, is working on quantum accelerators, basically quantum-based application-specific integrated circuits. These quantum chips will run in parallel with classical computers and attack problems in the near term. Algorithms that require less qubits, like simulating the structure and properties of molecules and chemical reactions. So even though I had jobs outside of quantum computing, I still got to travel to Japan and Switzerland in 2019 for the IBM Kiskit camps. You can see the trophies that I won back here and the vlog that I made from the Switzerland camp. And this is the reason I really started this channel. I got second place in IBM's Europe Kiskit camp for work in improving performance of Kiskit and first place in IBM's Asia Kiskit camp for designing a pulse programming language for quantum computing. I'll link our presentations down below. So in some ways, my entrance into quantum computing is pretty traditional. I got a physics degree and I went to graduate school for a bit, but I did make some detours along the way. In some ways, my path is completely untraditional. I'm doing this YouTube thing and even trying to teach quantum on TikTok. I've gotten to meet some of the most amazing people and researchers through these Kiskit camps and through social media. Academia is usually pretty closed off to outsiders. But because we now have cloud quantum chips, a lot more people are getting into the field. I never thought I'd be doing any of this, by the way. I really thought I'd be a professor at a university. So if you are in school now and thinking about studying physics, I think it's a great idea to do so. Before, back in my time when I started college in 2008, there were a lot more questions about what can you actually do with a physics degree? You can't really get a job in it. Definitely, there was a time when physics jobs only existed for PhDs. Now, however, Silicon Valley loves hiring physicists, so if you don't want to do research, there's always that option. You can work in hardware manufacturing or quantum computing, even in industry. There are so many startups that have popped up in the last five years doing quantum computing, and larger companies are now building quantum computing departments. And these companies are in totally different markets, so there's quantum computing groups in biotech, in finance, in defense. With a physics degree, you can also do science policy or patents. In the end, what physics does is helps you think critically and be able to model a complex system. That's useful in any job and has always helped me. One of my favorite responses to interview questions asking about my physics degree is saying, hey, I'm a physics major, so I can learn anything really quickly. There is one thing I do regret about my physics degree, and that's not having taken more computer science courses. But if you're not in school anymore, we're living in an era where there's a ton of material and content out there that helps you work with and interact with a real quantum computer. There are multiple quantum computers in the cloud that you can run your own experiments on. So read books, check out online courses, and run experiments on these quantum chips. I've actually made a couple YouTube videos on these resources and platforms, so I'll link them down below. So I personally have no idea how large the quantum computing space will grow, or even if I want to stay in it forever. But I do know that my journey has given me a lot of choice of what I can do in the future, and I don't regret a single moment. I'll make another video about how I got into software engineering without a CS degree or bootcamp, and more advice for getting started into quantum computing and finding jobs in the field. So if you like this video, like and subscribe, and thank you for supporting my channel, and leave any comments down below.